So welcome to this program, and uh, we're at the Royal College of uh, General Practitioners. Uh, I'm Peter Lin. Uh, I'm a family physician in uh, Canada, and uh, we want to welcome our online viewers uh, to this program. Uh, some of you had joined us earlier in uh, April uh, when we did the first part of this, and then now we have part two. And I believe that all of this will become available uh, on the website uh, at the Royal College of General Practitioners uh, in the coming months. Uh, and we want to thank our live audience here as well. Uh, we have about uh, 1,600 uh, participants online that are signed on, so we want to welcome them all. And I do have a bit of housekeeping. This is the most technical part for me. I have to read that this program was co-developed by the MD Briefcase, uh, the Canadian Society of Endocrinology and Metabolism, which is CSUM, uh, the International Society of Endocrinology, uh, and the Royal College of General Practitioners, the RCGP Learning. Uh, and this was with an unrestricted educational grant from Novo Nordisk. And of course, everything was planned to have the highest uh, uh, scientific integrity, objectivity, and balance. Uh, for those that are uh, logging in online, you'll notice that at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little chat box. So if you click on that little chat icon, uh, then you can actually ask your questions and it'll pop up here uh, on my tablet so then I can choose to ignore or take your questions. So we'll decide which ones are useful. Uh, and also the, for our live audience, again, we will have questions that we will uh, field towards the end. But we'll have the discussions first uh, and then we'll move from there. So joining us today, uh, we have uh, our esteem uh, panel. So to my left, we have uh, Dr. David Strain. So David, just introduce yourself briefly, because if I was introducing you, I would spew and spew <coughs> about your accomplishments. So maybe so, you could make um, it shorter. Thank you very much. I'm David Strain. I'm a clinical academic from the University of Exeter Medical School. I do lots of work focusing on older adults with diabetes, um, particularly uh, with the new frailty guidelines that in the UK we're implementing. And in my spare time, I run mechanistic studies looking particularly at the increase in base therapies. Mm, excellent, excellent. Thomas, Dr. Thomas Round, uh, primary care physician. So tell us about uh, yourself, Thomas. Thank you, Peter. So I'm a, I'm a GP in uh, East London with a large diabetic population. I'm also an academic at King's College and I'm an education lead for the RCGP. So I look at new guidelines, new research evidence and how we can implement that into, into clinical practice. And uh, an interest as a, as a GP, as average GP will have 100 to 200 diabetic patients. So if we've got 1,600 online, that's potentially hundreds of thousands of patients that could be affected by our, our uh, webinar today. So we better be careful what we say. Oh, yes. <laughs> and then, <laughs> so way across the pond, sort of strategically, is uh, Dr. David Lau uh, coming from Canada. Dr. Lau? Hi. Uh, my name is David Lau. I'm an academic uh, endocrinologist from the University of Calgary. And I just finished my term as editor-in-chief of the Canadian Journal of Diabetes. I have a special interest in diabetes, obesity, and, and lipid disorders. And also part of the guidelines in Canada as well. So we have sort of an expert panel sort of spanning the whole spectrum of diabetes care here. Um, and the purpose of this meeting was to bring us up to date with the American Diabetes Guideline meeting that, or the association meeting that just happened uh, in the beginning of June. So there were a lot of new studies, so we thought we would sort of catch up uh, everybody in terms of that, there were studies on DPP-4, GLP-1, as well as SGLT-2s, uh, and there were lots of them. So I think we've selected a few that might be of interest uh, to this audience and to our online audience and uh, in terms of diabetes care. So let's get started with the first one. The first one was Carolina. And so Carolina, uh, just to give you some background, this was the DPP-4 linagliptin versus SU therapy, uh, glamipiride, and it was 6,033 uh, people. Uh, and it's got the longest follow-up in terms of a study in, in the DPP-4 world at 5.9 years median. Um, so maybe we'll start off with uh, David Lau far on the uh, other side. Uh, so what were the results of the Carolina looking at DPP-4 versus an SU? Well, before uh, I talk about the Carolina data, perhaps uh, just to remind the audience that the Carmelina trial was actually done and published earlier uh, comparing uh, standards of care and people receiving placebo or five milligrams of linagliptin, so it was a CV outcome trial. So the Carolina trial is another uh, CV outcome trial, but now we have an active comparator between linagliptin five milligrams and glimepuride uh, uh, one to four milligram up titrated according to the A1C. So after a median follow-up of 5.9 years, the results came out that, in fact, uh, they're comparable in terms of CV safety. In other words, linagliptin is no different from glimipuride, one to four milligrams, when it comes to uh, the event-driven 
maze or three-point maze, namely non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, or cardiovascular mortality. However, that said, in terms of the secondary outcome, there was a tremendous difference in terms of hypoglycemia, in particular, uh, moderate to severe hypoglycemia, which was seen mainly in the glimepiride group compared to the linagliptin group. Okay, all right, so big hypoglycemia, I think the rate was somewhere around 37... 77% reduction. 77% reduction, reduction. Yeah. in the people on the side with the SUs, they had high hypoglycemia. Thomas, I mean, you're, you're dealing with SUs all the time in your patients. How, how does that sort of reflect? Yeah, so I would say in, in clinical practice in the UK, SUs are, uh, are very, very commonly prescribed as, as a second line after, after metformin. I should say most patients would be on metformin as first line treatment. Um, and really this is further evidence around potentially the risks around, around these drugs. And maybe that's something we don't do so well in primary care. You know, we, we discuss around, you know, particularly if you've got a, a 10 minute consultation, you're starting medications. It's really about that risk of um, hypoglycemia and individualizing that to the, to, the, to the individual patient you see. We'll be touching later on around the guidelines and having a look at NICE sign and maybe some, uh, the Canadian guidelines as well. Yeah, so hypoglycemia is an important issue, yeah, even in a randomized right. trial where we've sort of told people, be careful about hypoglycemia. <laughs> David, so, I mean, Thomas has sort of given us an experience from his center about, you, you've looked at all sorts of observational data, sort of multiple Thomas's uh, practices. What, what do you see when you look at Absolutely, yeah. so th this actually was one of the biggest surprises of the whole of the ADA, the fact that this big change in hypoglycemia wasn't associated with cardiovascular outcomes because we'd seen in multiple previous studies in the observational data of hundreds of thousands of people that sulfonylureas particularly were associated with a much higher risk of hypoglycemia uh, and that translated to more myocardial infarctions and um, cardiovascular death. So the fact that the randomized <coughs> control trial didn't show it is suggesting one of two things. Either these thousands and thousands of patients in real-world trials are not representative of the randomized control study, which is, is that true to a certain degree. In the randomized control study, highly selective populations, you don't get the frail elderly, you don't get the, the patients who are poorly adherent to the drugs, you get a very select population or whether there is a lot to addition to be said for spending more time with a patient. Remember, when you're in a randomized control trial, you're getting regular consultations, 20 to 30 minutes, you're getting phone calls, you're getting all that support to make sure that you are continuing to take your medication. Whereas in the real world, it may well be that a person has a hypo and then they stop taking their drugs, but they're not as well educated as us. So it's not just the sulfonylurea that disappears, it's the antihypertensive, it's the statin, and maybe what we see in the real world data is the personal effect of having a hypoglycemia rather than the actual biochemical effect. Mm -hmm. And the other thing to point out is these cardiovascular outcome trials are looking at cardiovascular outcomes. As our patients get more mature, only about half of our people with diabetes actually die of a cardiovascular event. It doesn't capture the fractured neck ephemers, the falls, the generalized hospitalization and that personal impact. So although I think this does give us good reassurance that with a sulfonylurea in the right person, you are not doing any harm, mm -hmm. it doesn't tell us how we work in the real world with those patients that are not included in this very select randomized controlled trial. Okay, so selected population, very well looked after, monitored very well. Yeah. And even then, they still had the big hypoglycemia, but at yeah. least no cardiovascular yeah. difference between the two groups in the randomized trial. Whereas in the real world data, we do see a differential between the two. So maybe for our learning purposes is that if we are, are using SUs, let's pick those patients, let's warn them about the hypoglycemia, let's, let's try and do some of the things that they did in the trial, but be aware that the hypoglycemia rate will still be uh, high with those people. Yeah. Okay, so that's useful because I know that that was sort of the, the last of the DPP-4 sort of speak uh, studies and, and that sort of tweaked everybody's attention at the meeting. Um, the other one is uh, Rewind. Okay, so the Rewind, and I, I hate to use these acronyms, but the actual names of the studies are so long, we sort of shortened them to these things. Um, and there was quite a bit about GLP-1. So just to give a little bit background on the GLP-1 agents. Um, so as you all know, we have insulin, that takes sugar out of our body, or out of our bloodstream, 
and we have glucagon that puts sugar into our bloodstream. So while you were munching outside, then basically the um, insulin is working harder and the glucagon is supposed to stay put and not put sugar in. Uh, and then tonight when you're sleeping, then it should be glucagon that's putting sugar into your bloodstream and insulin should sort of take it easy. So that's the balancing act. And that balancing act is done by the GLP-1. So when you eat food, your intestine makes the GLP-1 and it goes to the uh, beta cells in the pancreas and says, you make some insulin, and it tells the alpha cells, the glucagon, you take it easy. So it works very nicely. Uh, in type 2 diabetes, unfortunately, we have a bit of a defect there. So the GLP-1 may not be working so well. So that's why there's now lots of um, studies looking at, should we be replacing that GLP-1? And so that's why you're going to hear much more about GLP-1 kind of studies. Um, and David, we have a lot of different GLP-1s. Can you just help us? Because there's, the names are all over the place, and, and how can we sort of sort them yeah. out? In terms I mean, of even amongst the GLP-1s, there's big differences between <laughs> them. You've got the daily versus the weekly. Mm. Um, you've also got where they come from. Because the original GLP-1 studies were based on a chemical that was extracted from saliva from a helium monster, a, a big lizard. Um, and it was observed that this lizard doesn't eat very much. And it was the ingredient of its saliva that controls its appetite. And we discovered that this exendin-4 that would actually help control our appetite and have this GLP-1-like effect. And so you get the GLP-1 receptor agonists, and these are the exendin-4-based drugs. It's elixisenatide and exenatide that are based on the, this exendin-4. Mm -hmm. And then you get more, um, more uh, analogous to human GLP-1. Mm -hmm. So you get analogs that are 94 to 97% similar to native GLP-1. Um, and the problem with all of these that we have at the moment is they're all injectable therapies. I mean, they're all peptides that have to be given via injection in order to get them into the body the way things are running. But we do have this discrepancy between the exendin 4s and the GLP-1s, and then between some of them the short-acting and some of them long-acting. And I think as we go through the studies, we might start to notice patterns appear appearing mm -hmm. on the differences between those. Okay, so excellent. So there's based on where the molecule comes from. And the reason why we don't give human GLP-1, you're probably sitting there going, why don't we give human GLP-1, is because the DPP-4 enzyme would break it down in two minutes. So therefore, it's very rapid breakdown. So that's why we had to look for molecules that look like our GLP-1 but could not be exactly the same. Otherwise, it would get cut up. So now we have sort of the twice a week, uh, twice a day, once a day, and then we have once a week injections as well. Uh, by using some of these strategies. So one of the studies that was sort of a, a buzz at the ADA, the meeting was the Rewind study. Uh, and in this study, it was interesting because they had both secondary prevention patients and primary, a large chunk of primary prevention. So they didn't have a heart attack or stroke or cardiovascular event yet, so around 70% of them. And that study was 9,901 patients. And the median follow-up for a GLP-1 study, this one is long, so it's 5.4 years. I think it's the longest one. Uh, and so basically, it was dulaglutide once a week versus usual care. So that was the study design. So David, can I have you go over what the results were? Because it was everybody was talking about this, uh, this particular study. Well, certainly. There, this was a, almost like the talk of town to understand uh, what the rewind data showed, especially with the top-line results that were announced much earlier on. Um, as, as Peter alluded to, there were more than 9,900 people uh, enrolled in this study and divided equally among uh, placebo versus active treatment with, uh, you know, uh, with dulaglutide, uh, 1.5 milligram subcutaneously once a week. So after a median follow-up of about 5.4 years, uh, there was a statistically significant 18% reduction in the three-point maze or major adverse cardiovascular events, namely, again, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, or cardiovascular mortality. What was also very interesting was the fact that in terms of the pre-specified subgroup of analysis, there was absolutely no difference in terms of the duration of diabetes, gender, uh, baseline A1C, and so on. In other words, the benefit of 12% relative risk reduction was seen in both the primary cohort as well as in the secondary prevention cohort. And once again, there was no difference with respect to gender, baseline A1C, duration of diabetes, whether or not they have prior cardiovascular disease. 
Uh, so the, the results were actually very consistent. Uh, again, bearing in mind that these are individuals, about two thirds of them were considered as primary prevention. In other words, uh, they do not have evidence of cardiovascular disease, but multiple risk factors present, as opposed to the other third with established cardiovascular disease. Okay, so what we're hearing is many of these studies, when they were told to do a safety study, they would go after the high-risk cardiovascular patients, so people that had a heart attack, stroke, what we would call secondary prevention. Uh, and it was called secondary prevention because when we did the lipid trials, we would say, okay, you have a heart attack, then I know you have cholesterol problems, and then we'll try and prevent the second one from happening. That's where the secondary prevention came from. Uh, and primary prevention is we're trying to prevent the very first one. So many of the studies started off with secondary prevention group first, and then now you're seeing many studies capturing the primary prevention group as well, uh, knowing that about 75% of the patients that we treat are actually primary prevention. They haven't had a heart attack or a stroke uh, in the world. So uh, useful information coming out. Thomas, so now it's going into your world, primary prevention world patients. Primary care where so, we have so, <laughs> consultations, we're all kind of a bit stressed. And, yeah, yeah, so um, what, are, what are you going to do with this result yeah, that we're gonna it's 12% so, um, better? I mean, I have a handful of patients who are on GLP-1s, and I would say, um, and again in the UK, it might, uh, might be different in other countries, we also have our local CCG prescribing guidance as well, and I would find that um, if I felt a patient might benefit from a GLP-1, I'd probably have a discussion with my local endocrinologist, who's quite quick, I get a rapid rapid reply and then we might initiate. Now my practice nurses are happy to show patients because it is an injection, they need a little bit of training on it around the safety of it and we need time like uh, David says. Um, so I say I've got a handful of patients but I've had some really good outcomes. I had a patient who were, was, had obesity, was really struggling, didn't want to go on insulin, actually went on one of these drugs and had, has had a great lost, lost weight and it's not just Previously, we just focused on HbA1c, and, there, and we have to individualize those targets, but now we're looking at actually risk profiles for reduction in cardiovascular disease, which is important. Now, we, we had a little calculation on the NNT, and I know maybe some GPs like or, or family physicians like the number needed to treat. So we, we talked about an NNT of primary prevention of around 60, so you'd have to treat 60 patients for five years to prevent one uh, cardiovascular event, and that's primary prevention. But actually, if you look at the, the NICE guidelines on primary prevention for statins, they talk about 10% risk, which is a, probably a similar NNT, actually. Um, and we look at secondary prevention, it's around 18. So 18 patients would be treated to prevent one cardiovascular event. So actually, you know, positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. I guess clearly we'll come on to that looking at individualizing guidelines. These drugs are, particularly for NICE, are further down the line uh, and they are more expensive. So we're talking about uh, 70 to 70 pounds to 100 pounds a month versus we talked about SUs around one to two pounds. So there is a price differential, but potentially in economic analysis going forward, it'll be the prevention of those cardiovascular events, which is important. Right, so there is a cost issue because the, the bi biologics of these proteins are more expensive to produce. And I should just say also that we know with injections, some patients struggle with those mm -hmm. and, and maybe uh, there is a dropout rate from, from uh, Injection. GLP-1 injections, right. and uh, not, not insignificant. Right. And then there's nausea issue that we have to manage as well, so those two things. Now David, um, the Rewind is just one of many of the GLP-1 studies, so can you just help us, you know, you nicely did the extendin and all that kind of stuff, that was nice, you know, the left hand and right hand. Um, can you uh, just go over the results of the, of the trials up to this point, and what does Rewind sort of add to this? Uh, yeah, so rewind actually fits perfectly into the pattern. Um, so when I said before, we have the, the exendin-4 based drugs, so that's lixizenatide and exenatide. We've had three studies that have used those type of drugs. We've had the elixir trial with lixizenatide that showed cardiovascular safety. It met its primary outcome that showed no increase in cardiovascular risk. We then had Excel used in exenatide and that also showed cardiovascular safety. Now there were trends towards reductions here, there and everywhere, but the primary outcome that they met was cardiovascular safety. Then there's been a third study in um, an Exendin-4 drug that we don't know very much about. The, the Freedom study was um, a study using another version of Exenatide that works via an implant and therefore it is constantly being eluted over a three to six month period, which means you've got 100% adherence because when it's in, you don't have to take an injection. We've never seen the results of that. There was a press release that said it met its primary outcome of cardiovascular safety around three years ago, but we still haven't seen the results of that trial. 
So the suggestion is that it's not going to give us any extra benefit, because if there was extra benefit, I'm sure we would have heard about it by now. Then when we look on the, the GLP-1 analog side, so these are the ones that have been made around the natural human GLP-1 that just last a lot longer. The first of those to report was the LEADER trial. That was using liraglutide. Um, and that demonstrated very nicely a cardiovascular risk reduction across the board. Now, that did include a small number of people with primary prevention that were actually selected for different reasons. Didn't seem to show the same benefit, but then there were also some other oddities about it. So um, if you look at the study carefully, you don't benefit if you're from North America, but in the audience, we don't particularly care about that, but the international audience might worry about that. Um, so don't read too much into those subgroup analyses. The next study to report on this side was actually the Sustain 6. Now, Sustain 6 is for the recently launched semaglutide, which is another once weekly GLP-1 analog. And actually that was a cardiovascular safety study. That wasn't really powered to show superiority. But that notwithstanding, they still managed to show superiority, even with a very small number of events over a very small um, time. It only went on for two years. But again, you have to be very careful that that was not originally designed as a superiority study. So all that you can say is it definitely is safe and it has probably got some benefit because it met statistical difference. The next study we saw was Harmony, and this is albiglutide. Now, this is a very interesting drug because the uh, GSK stopped producing it because it doesn't meet the HbA1c requirements or the weight loss requirements to maintain its role in NICE. But they continued the trial, and they went on to demonstrate a cardiovascular risk reduction, even though they don't reduce HbA1c or the weight. And that really cemented the role of this GLP-1 analog, that this is not just having a sugar and weight loss effect. Now, Rewind fits in perfectly with that system that it is another GLP-1 analog that is showing a very similar 12 to 13% risk reduction. And the other thing from my own point of view, looking at people working in, particularly in stroke, is that all of these studies seem to have a more rapid effect reducing stroke than they do on other events. And that's something that we're hoping to be exploring in the future because this stroke effect was probably not a direct atherosclerotic effect in the same way that um, many of the others, so things like the statins and the antihypertensives. So that looks like something that well worth exploring, that a symmetrical effect, really noticeable in the sustained population, and um, also similar sorts of numbers seen here in the Rewind trial. Okay, all right, so in other words, based on the molecule where it comes from, that seems to separate out sort of relatively positive studies across the board, not so positive studies with the, with the Gila Monster they're version. Safe. I think. Yeah, they're, they're safe. safe. I mean, it's got to be important to say that we're in a right. market where safety. But of course, right. one of the biggest problems we still have, as um, Tom alluded to, mm. is that these are an injectable therapy. And the process of doing that in an eight to 10 minutes uh, consultation that you have, you're still faced with the education around an injection and what to expect, how to deal with the nausea. And even though it's only once weekly injections, mm -hmm. we still have to spend our time educating on them. Yeah, so Thomas, you have patients on there, so you find that the explanation of the injections and everything else. Yeah, and I would say primary care is a team-based approach. So we have practice nurses that um, would help ma manage that, along with um, getting advice from our local endocrinology colleagues and, and diabetes specialist nurses on that, yeah. Okay, so that's good because I think injection is always a barrier, cost mm. is always a barrier, nausea is always a barrier. Those are the three sort of barriers that we have with GLP-1s for the moment. And you had mentioned that for the moment it's injectables, but Pioneer 6... Uh, that was another interesting study that people were talking about is an oral GLP-1. So um, one of the problems is, is that GLP-1 is a big protein. So how do you get that into your system without breaking down? Like I, I can't swallow insulin and get it into my body. I wish we, I'm sure all our patients would love to do that. So, so David, you're the mechanistic guy. So how did they get... <laughs> yeah. um, you know, a GLP-1 to go in, oh, in a pill form. This is a hugely clever process that's taken place. Because, as you say, peptides, as soon as they hit the stomach, they just become uh, metabolized. They become broken down, and it's been almost impossible to this moment to get any peptide orally. And what the very clever scientists have managed to do is put a protein, a snack protein, do not ex me, ex uh, expect me to do the full name for it, but snack protein, sits nicely with the semaglutide, 
and it enables it to be absorbed. Now, we still need to have a very high dose of the semaglutide in order to do this. So to put it into context, when we're injecting, we're injecting one milligram a week. When we're taking it as a tablet, we're taking 14 milligrams a day. So we're having to give exponentially higher doses in order to achieve the same glycemic concentration. But what we do find is you get that glycemic concentration of the semaglutide, which is enabled to give you very, very similar results when it comes to HbA1c reduction and weight loss with the added advantage that because it's being absorbed through the stomach, it's actually going to where it needs to go. It's ending up into the portal system. And so the first point of call for it is going to be the liver before it then gets distributed around the body, as opposed to a subcutaneous injection, which goes around the body in the first place. So unfortunately, it physiologically makes sense, but then it gets removed. So yes. therefore, you need much more of it. OK. All right, so now we have an oral version of it. And that's why Pioneer 6 was interesting, uh, because this was a safety trial. So therefore, a safety trial, uh, it's uh, 3,183, so a little bit smaller, a little bit shorter in duration. 15.9 uh, months is the, uh, the median. Uh, they also had primary and secondary patients. So secondary would be people over 50 with heart disease, uh, cardiovascular disease or kidney disease, and then primary prevention uh, would be people over 60 with risk factors. So they had a mixture of the two just to see uh, are these agents safe. Uh, and so, David, maybe I'll turn it to you in terms of the results of Pioneer 6 because it's a very tiny study. It shouldn't have received the attention that it did, but I think because it's an oral GLP-1, I think that's why people paid attention. Well, as you mentioned, this is a CV safety trial to demonstrate that there's no 80% access in CV mortality as mandated by the FDA. Uh, it's a smaller study with about over just over 1,600 uh, people in each arm. Uh, standard of care, randomized to placebo or uh, semaglutide, but orally 14 milligrams as opposed to the equivalent of one milligram subcutaneously. And after a very short median of 16 months, just under 16 months, uh, there was observed a 21% relative risk reduction in the three-point maze. Again, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, and cardiovascular mortality. Unfortunately, the statistical results did not show significance in the primary endpoint. However, in terms of the secondary pre-specified endpoint, in terms of components of the three-point maze, there was close to a 50% reduction in cardiovascular mortality as well as in all-cause mortality. And in terms of other metabolic outcomes, in terms of secondary outcomes, uh, there was a 0.7% difference in the A1C, even though this is not uh, an A1C lowering trial, even though it's a CV outcome trial, hoping for equipoise in terms of A1C reduction. Nonetheless, there was still a 0.7% reduction, and also significantly a four kilogram difference uh, over time between semaglutide versus placebo. Uh, so these are the important outcomes, but again, a 21% relative risk reduction, non-statistically significant in terms of the primary outcome. So that means when you look at the graph, the dot is over by that amount, but the tail crosses the one. So we would say it's not significant. For sure, it means that it is not worse than usual care. And by the way, when we say placebo, it doesn't mean no care, OK? Because a lot of people get confused. Wow, we just let people kind of rot with their diabetes. So when we say placebo, it means they're, everybody's getting usual care. And then what happens is that we add on the new medication, and then we add on a placebo pill on the other side, just so that they feel like they're doing something and they're not special and they haven't been singled out. So when we, unfortunately, when we say placebo, it feels like we're not doing anything for them. Um, so just remember that everybody is getting usual diabetes care, but they're not allowed to have, you know, obviously the drug that we're studying. Um, so therefore, the primary endpoint was meant that it was safe. Uh, and then the cardiovascular death, or the total death, was there was a difference. But because your main endpoint isn't significant, then this death endpoint is just interesting, but then we can't make too much of it. And the numbers were quite small. Um, so we're talking about 40-something, I think, in terms of death. So, so I don't want you to walk away thinking that this saves everybody, but it certainly is in the right direction that we're, that we're seeing. Um, now, David, you, you, you've worked with the snack and all those kind of things, and you've worked with some of these trials. 
tell us how do you how do you take this thing? Do you just drink water with it and, and swallow yeah, it? Yeah, this this is. I mean, there there are going to be one or two problems with orosomagritide. It's it's it, firstly it's not available yet. It's not been launched anywhere in the world. It's currently under review by the FDA and the European Medicines Agency. So we're talking about the future of diabetes, and it does solve this injection problem, but it does come with its own problems. Um, it has to be taken on an empty stomach. It has to be taken with the right quantity of water. If you take it with too much or not enough, it can cause problems. Now, none of these are insurmountable. If you think about it, when bisphosphonates came out, we had exactly the same problems. Um, in, in many cases, we had greater problems because of the, the GI side effects that went with that that were far greater than we see with semaglutide. There are going to be one or other two considerations. We know that semaglutide, for example, changes absorption of thyroxine. Mm -hmm. So, and because those two medications are given commonly together, we may need to either increase our dose of thyroxine that we're giving in the morning, or maybe move thyroxine dosing to later in the day. Mm -hmm. And that should be relatively easy for us to fix. I think the biggest problem we're going to look at is going to be cost. Mm -hmm. Uh, we don't know how much this is going to be yet. Um, it's going to come at a premium. It probably, at least, is going to come at a premium. And we have to remember, we're going to be giving about 50 times more semaglutide a week mm. in order to get the same oral effect. And there, there has to be some cost implication that goes with that. But this is coming at about the right time, though, because at the moment in the UK, we're, we at least are just changing the way we do our cost modelling. With the advent of these cardiovascular outcome trials, we're now starting to use cost minimization models for health economics. I'm not going to bore you senseless with um, all of those elements of the health economists, except to say that when we start calculating whether a drug is cost effective, instead of just using the esoteric quality of life, quality adjusted life years game, we're going to also start including the fact that people on these drugs don't put as much weight on, they don't attend hospital as frequently, they are less likely to have heart attacks or strokes, and all of those have got cost implications as well as the negative, the, the, the quality adjusted life years. So hopefully these things are all going to be taken into account when we start considering how to use these drugs in primary care. Yeah, so Thomas, in primary care, do you think that this, I mean, it's an oral agent, and I think we were excited about it. We're, we're kind of horizon scanning at the moment, mm -hmm. knowing how, you know, it's going to take time before we, it's not even licensed yet, we don't know what the price is. And looking at innovations, I mean, if you talk about from uh, bench to bedside, we're looking at sort of 10 years or more. So, I, I, and certainly when these drugs come into clinical practice, like most new innovations, which are fairly expensive, will specialised use only. Um, so I expect over time it'll specialise use then with a shared care agreement for primary care to be involved. But clearly we need to have, in the, in the UK at least, nice and signed to have a look at these and look at cost effectiveness analysis. And I understand that these drugs may be coming in online later this year. So quite exciting, but I would say bring it back down to earth. We're looking at, we want some maybe some further data, real world data, maybe looking at a few years down the line, especially for, for primary care prescriptions for this. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting because these are being fast-tracked through, through the agencies because the agencies have all accepted we already have some maglutide on the shelf. We've already got clear evidence that this is reducing events and improving the quality of life. And what this is is just a different way of administering it. So we're not going to see the normal bench to bedside of 10 to 15 years, but, but we still are going to get the experience. issues around injections and, yeah. and compliance, as yeah. we all know, even with oral tablets, how difficult compliance can be. Yes. So what we're hearing is that the science is there already around the molecule, and what this whole process is is trying to make it easier for patients, right? Like, I mean, really, if you're a scientist, you'll say, I showed you the molecule, I showed you the benefits, but really this is an attempt to let other people uh, enjoy the benefits of some of these you know, results uh, yeah. in terms of that. David? Yeah, but perhaps we should also emphasize that the other benefits are the weight loss as well as the A1C reduction, which is very significant. Mm -hmm. You know, rarely do we see an oral class of medication that is so effective in terms of lowering the A1C by more than 1% and body weight of four kilograms over a short period of time. Uh, so again, these are important benefits from our patient perspective. Uh, we as diabetologists are more focused on glucose control complications, but from the patient perspective, body weight is a very important consideration and importantly, lack of hypoglycemia. So these are very, very important uh, benefits uh, that could be ascribed to just the oral GLP-1 receptor agonist. So I think, I think that's the reason why Pioneer 6 has received a lot of 
uh, attention and publicity for that matter. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's really yeah, an exciting time It was a bit of a buzz us. at the meeting, that's for sure. Absolutely. And, and the other thing is that I think we're all very comfortable using DPP-4 inhibitors. So if you think about it, the DPP-4 enzyme breaks down the GLP-1, so that's why we blocked it, so that your natural GLP-1 would last a bit longer. So now we have an option of giving you the GLP-1 analog uh, in a pill form. So I think that's why it may give us an extension on how do we mess with the incretin system fixing it uh, without using a DPP-4, because we're running out of steam in some of the DPP-4s. We give the DPP-4, the A1Cs come down a bit, but we still need a bit more help. So therefore, that's why these oral GLP-1s may be, may be helpful uh, as we look beyond what to do with the DP4 and incretin system. So I think that keep, keep that in, tuned in, there will be some time, so therefore we don't have to use these agents right away. But I like the bisphosphonate sort of comparison. So when the bisphosphonate came out, remember we told people you gotta sit up and drink this water and stuff like that. So similarly, we've got around that, so I think we will be able to get around those things. Now, the last block of studies was SGLT2 inhibitors. You know, so we've heard a lot about SGLT2 inhibitors. At the meeting, um, there were two that had more data coming out. One was DECLARE and the other one was CREDENCE. Um, so the DECLARE study, just to remind people, that was presented at the American Heart. Uh, previously, 17,160 patients, average follow-up 4.2 years, also a, a long study. And so the, sort of the specialty of that study, or the key feature of that one, was 60% primary prevention patients in there, so a lot like what our practice would look like, and then 40% was secondary prevention. Uh, so the main results had come up, and maybe what I'll do is I'll ask David just to remind us of the main results, and also at the ADA they presented some renal data as well. Yeah, so the, the DECLARE, as you say, was American Heart Association last year, and we did touch on that briefly when we, we got together in April. Um, but the, the key result from DECLARE was in this very primary prevention population, it didn't show a reduction in that three-point MACE, predominantly because the, the three-point MACE events were so few and far between. What it did show a reduction is in heart failure, and that seems to have been a common theme that's gone through all of those SGLT2 inhibitor trials, that it seemed to reduce both incident and heart failure hospitalizations in the secondary prevention and also in the primary prevention population. So it does seem to give some role in the, the patients with heart failure. But what's always been interesting with the SGLT2 inhibitors, and when they first came out, there was always the worry that this is a drug that is effectively another diuretic. And it's going to put more sugar into the bladder, and it is working on the kidneys. And we know that the kidneys of people with diabetes are particularly sensitive. We know that the people, the people with diabetes are more prone to acute kidney injuries and chronic kidney disease. So there's always been this caution that are SGLT2 inhibitors going to make CKD worse? And that the CKD results from the DAPA study are actually really positive. We see a reduction in chronic kidney disease. We see a reduction in acute kidney injuries. And this is not just in the secondary prevention population. This is also in our primary population prevention population. So for the first time, we know we have drugs that can reduce chronic kidney disease along the, that whole spectrum. And that starts to raise the possibility about whether these drugs are having all of their effect through sugar, or whether they're going to have additional effects beyond just the sugar and weight loss effect that you see from SGLT2s. Okay, great. So the, because I think we were concerned there used to be the EGF car cutoffs, which there still are. But that was because the sugar doesn't go out of your kidneys, so your A1C doesn't come down enough. So the agency said, you know, all the regulatory agencies around said, if you're not lowering A1C, then below 45 EGFR, that might not be useful. But what David's alluding to is that there's a flow benefit as well. Just like, remember, ACEs, they have blood pressure lowering and things like that, but they also have flow benefits in your kidneys. So that's why we use them now in chronic kidney disease and so on and so forth. And so the same thing is happening with the SGLT2 inhibitors, and that's what was presented with the DAPA. Yeah. Uh, and and interestingly, the, the way that they work is we know that although the kidneys aren't filtering as well in a person with diabetes, every individual nephron is actually working harder. So every individual nephron works harder in order to adapt for the fact that we've lost 20% of our kidney function. 
And so what these do is make every single nephron that's working harder just that little bit life easier. So as a result, we do see an immediate dip in the kidney function. When we start these drugs, the kidney function does drop in exactly the same way as the ACE inhibitors drop when you first stop it. But that's making every single nephron's job easier, and therefore every nephron will continue to live just that little bit longer, which means it has a longer-term protective effect. Good. Uh, and the one key feature about the DECLARE study was that the entry criteria, the EGFR, had to be above 60. And so therefore, the average EGFR was 85. So pretty much these were normal-ish kidneys. People on the, um, the uh, dapagliflozin arm maintained, and then the placebo arm or the people usual care deteriorated. So in other words, in normal-ish kidneys, uh, we can have some benefit as well. The second study that was interesting was Credence. So we have the declared data on renal saying in normalish kidneys we can do something with SGLT2s. And then we have Credence study which was looking at the other direction. How about sicker kidneys? Um, and so these were patients with uh, proteinuria and also uh, EGFRs between 30 and all the way down to 30 to 90 in that range. 4,401 patients. The follow-up was 2.62 years. And it was actually stopped early because the results uh, had sort of crossed bounds. And uh, David, maybe you can fill us in. So this is the sicker kidney population. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Uh, again, let's remind ourselves that the EMPA-REG, DECLARE, and the CANVAS and CANVAS-R data uh, are primarily generated in people with EGFR over 60. And this is a particular study focused on people with EGFR 30 to 90 mils per minute and evidence of albuminuria. So this is a totally different population of individuals with diabetes and chronic kidney disease, and of course, the cardiovascular disease risk is higher. Uh, so as Peter alluded to, the study was terminated earlier because of the results uh, showing that in terms of the primary outcome, which is a composite of renal and cardiovascular outcome, and that is, uh, uh, you know, end-stage kidney disease, doubling of the serum creatinine, or cardiovascular or renal death. So in terms of the uh, primary outcome, there was a 30% reduction with canagliflozin at a, the low dose of 100 milligrams, given over a median of 2.6 years. So this is a hugely important, significant reduction of 30% uh, in terms of the uh, the, renal out, uh, the, uh, the composite renal outcome. And in terms of the secondary endpoint, in terms of the hard renal outcome, again, there was a, a significant reduction. Uh, so highlighting the fact that individuals with decreased EGFR, even though they may have lower efficacy in terms of A1C lowering, but they saw huge benefits in terms of renal protection. So it really is a game changer to highlight the fact that SGLT2 inhibitors in this case, canagliflozin truly reduced the worsening of kidney disease in terms of heart renal outcome. And I think this will clearly uh, change the practice, not just of nephrologists and hopefully of diabetologists and people uh, with diabetes over the long term. Thomas, what do you think? Now, now you've got the two ends. You've got healthy kidneys, sick kidneys, SGLT2. And absolutely. I mean, we know in diabetic patients we need to optimize their, their uh, renal management. We know it's the most common cause of CKD. And I've seen patients going into kidney failure and needing dialysis from diabetes. So, and we know as GPs we're kind of checking their urines, they're checking the albumin creatinine ratios, we're checking their use and ease. So this potentially is a, and I, I think in terms of SGLT2s, uh, these are in the guidelines, they're both in the NICE uh, UK, England guideline and the SIGN guideline. And I would think most GPs are starting to use these in practice, but this is further evidence actually that long term we're getting re reductions in CKD and um, improved uh, renal outcomes. So again, it's that individualizing that treatment, not just the glycemic control, but actually looking at long term, what are the, what are the long term uh, consequences of your, of your diabetes. Right, so then it gives you confidence that you can use these things in, in multiple ranges of and patients. Not to really say cost, but I think they're around 30 pounds so yeah, yeah, a month. Yeah, so. Sure. <laughs> and the UK were quite often cost. Important. Yes. <laughs> um, and the other thing is is that uh, in terms of there were genetic people uh, that are missing the SGLT2 their whole life. Uh, and so they've been spilling urine in their uh, sugar in their urine their whole life and their kidneys are fine. So that's why I think the, all the 
health agencies sort of said, we don't need 30 year studies because genetically we have these people and we're sort of in a sense making our patients like them in a way. So that's why maybe the safety part of it is, is better off. We still have to think about you know, the nuisance things like yeast infections and those kinds of things. So please remind patients to drink lots of water, dilute their urine so that they're not gonna get those things. Uh, and also just a brief mention of DKA, it's super rare. But in almost all the cases, it's patients stopping insulin. So they start the drug, they see their sugars come down, they say, I'm cured, they stop their insulin, and that usually gets them into trouble. So if you have patients on insulin, just tell them insulin does a different job, right? It moves sugar into cells. So you might need less insulin, but not to stop it. So those are some general tips just to make sure that, David, go ahead. Well, uh, the credence data, part, uh, they did a subgroup analysis and they were presented at the ADA with respect to safety. And in essence, uh, there was no increase in fracture or amputation risk reported uh, in the credence trial. Uh, so the events were comparable between canical flows in versus placebo in this uh, group of individuals who were, which were at higher risk. And I also should mention that the secondary uh, outcome in terms of cardiovascular uh, outcome was also significantly reduced uh, with canonical flows in at 100 milligrams. Uh, so all in all, I think the, the presentation at the ADA uh, on t in terms of the credence uh, trial demonstrated that canonical flows in uh, is safe in terms of no increase in fracture risk, no increase in amputation risk. Even though there was a slight uh, change in the uh, protocol amendment uh, following the, the announcement of the Canvas and Canvas R, and they did a, a subgroup, uh, they again repeated the analysis and again dem did not demonstrate any change uh, in terms of the uh, events uh, with respect to amputation or fracture risk. In other words, the change in the protocol that mandated foot examination did not change any uh, outcome altogether. Okay. So I think it offers uh, uh, you know, perhaps insights in terms of the safety. And, and just to remind people, we should always look for amputation risk in all of our diabetes patients. So if they have ulcers, they have neuropathy, if they're smokers, if they've had a previous amputation, that increases their risk very dramatically. So we just, I think all of this data is telling us that we need to be careful. We should look at feet. Uh, so we're suggesting in our clinic, we should have a sign that just says, take off your shoes and socks. That way I don't have to be there while they're doing that. And then we can see naked feet and we'll have a quick peek at them. And then I leave the room and they can take forever to put their shoes back on. But perhaps, you know, looking at feet might be a good thing for us. Um, let's just move quickly. We only have about 10 or 12 minutes left. Um, in terms of guidelines, uh, so Thomas, you know, lots of studies floating around. How, how might this change yeah, guidelines? I would say, as a family physician, um, you, to keep up to date, you need to read 10 research papers a day. It's just impossible. You know, you've got a busy clinic. You're seeing 30 to 40 patients a day. How the hell can I keep up to date? So we have guidelines. And we in, the, in England, we use NICE, which is developed in 2015, and then SIGN, which is a Scottish guideline. So we do have separate... Um, healthcare systems in the in the UK. A sign was 2017, and I should just say they do have a section. We haven't really touched on it today, but an important section on lifestyle factors, um, including uh, and, and education. Uh, importantly, at the ADA, there were some further results from the direct study, which was important, showing that in some diabetic type two diabetics, that actually at one or two years with a total diet replacement, you can actually get remission of your diabetes, which is pretty, I think, somewhat game changing. Um, and actually, in those patients, they were matched to no, um, normal controls without diabetes, and, and actually, at the two year follow up, their insulin secretion was, was similar uh, to, between diabetics and non diabetics. So that, that was very interesting. Going back to the guidelines, as I say, Nice is 2015. As a given, most guidelines will met formins, uh, your, your first agent. And then in terms of um, initiation, uh, intensification of treatment, there is a sort of flow chart in NICE, and it talks about a 7.5% in, in old, old money to going up to your next, uh, next agent. Uh, well, SIGN talks about a 7% um, HbA1c. And they do have, I'd say, a choice between uh, SUs, DTP, DPP4s, and SGLT2s. Um, and particularly in NICE, uh, GLP-1 comes further down that line, as in you've, you've down your sort of third line, still, not an, still no, no, no impact, and then uh, BMI above 35 within that. Uh, SIGN has a slightly softer uh, guideline on there. And I think, as we say, NICE, if you have a look on their website, they have done an evidence-based review, and the guideline is being reviewed at present in light of what we've heard around not just focusing on HbA1c and glycemic control, it's actually thinking about individualizing that treatment. Yes, to your elderly patients who are at risk of falls and maybe having a uh, less of a tight criteria for them, but also thinking about your cardiovascular risk and your kidney disease uh, outcome measures. 
And, and it's important to say that NICE are currently being uh, reviewed at the moment. So um, very recently, there's a group of us that have put a document in um, Diabetic Medicine, the Journal of Diabetes UK, which is bringing some guidance to the UK that is hopefully going to bring it closer in line with people like the ADA and the EASD to give some guidance about how to do this indi individualization. Because as you say, Tom, that NICE still does advocate individualization. Yes, yeah. But in 2015, when they wrote their last guidelines, that's before Empereg or Canvas or Leader or any of the studies we've been talking about today were published. So at the time they were written, they were absolutely right. It's just diabetes has just moved on so much in the last five years. And for family physicians, there's a useful flow chart. I, I had a look at the ADA and the, the American and European Consensus Guidelines, which does have that individualization around uh, uh, your cardiovascular risk and your chronic kidney disease risk. Exactly. And, and so in, in this, we've got for the Diabetes UK journal, the Diabetic Medicine, we are basically dividing our patients into three real cohorts. We've got those that we um, have got proven atherosclerotic disease, uh, the people who've had strokes and heart attacks or have got very high risk of strokes and heart attacks. And they're people who we think are going to benefit from the GLP-1s based on the, these studies that we've spoken about today. We've got people with organ failure, so the people with heart failure or with kidney failure. Um, and they're the people who are more likely to benefit from the SGLT2 inhibitors. And then we've got the rest of the population who we just need to be thinking about glycemic control, weight control, and HbA1c control, and looking at those as a global picture, and they're the ones who need to be individualized. But at the moment, we still don't have clear evidence of any superiorities within that group. So for the general population, we just need to individualize our things based on the needs of that one person that we're sat with. Okay, so based on the studies, we're sort of being specific, more prescriptive about which agents have evidence. David, uh, the Canadian guidelines were updated 2018, right. ADA ESD 2018. What, what do they have in similar? Well, the Diabetes Canada guidelines that were published uh, in 2018 basically highlighted the fact that we now have choice of uh, antihyperglycemic or glucose-lowering agents that uh, offer uh, CV outcome benefits. So in those individuals in whom they have established cardiovascular disease, our evidence-based recommendation is such that uh, clinicians should consider the use of either an SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor agonist based on the EMPAREC, the CANVAS trial, as well as the LEADER trial. Um, now, we're in the process of updating uh, the 2018 guidelines with an interim update that will be coming out soon, and I think it will, will be moving again away from the more glucocentric approach that we have been in the past towards more complications. I bet you very similar to what the ADA and EASD consensus recommendations would be, and that is to focus more on individuals who might have evidence of cardiovascular disease, and if that's the case, uh, then these are the medications to use. And furthermore, if they, have, uh, if they are at risk for kidney disease or heart failure, then SGLT2 inhibitors may be preferred to GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, for example. So I think there's a lot more granularity now that we have more and more classes of glucose-lowering agents available with different outcomes in addition to CV outcome benefits, and in particular with the CKD uh, and the renal outcomes that really changed us. And in terms of looking into the future, I think we're uh, we'll soon be talking about precision diabetes, in which case we're talking about using genetic determinants to identify uh, who might benefit from which particular modality, in particular because I think we have to think of type 2 diabetes as a very heterogeneous condition. It's not just one disease, and I think we all agree with that, but we're still a few years away from precision diabetes yet. So what I'm hearing but, is precision diabetes may be the ultimate in individualization. So right now when you see the word individualization, you're saying look at your patient and try and figure it out. Initially it was, are they at risk of hypoglycemia? Is it weight that they're concerned about? Is it cost? Those were the things that we're talking about. But as these studies are coming out, it's more like if they had a heart attack or a stroke, they might have more benefit with certain things, heart failure. If they have kidney disease, then certain things would be more beneficial to them. So it looks like we're still using the concept of individualization, but we're adding in more things to look at uh, as we move to the future. 
I'm just going to open it for the last couple of minutes. There was one or two questions online, and then we'll, we'll have a session afterwards if you'd like to ask more questions. Um, so there's just one quick question from Claire. Uh, what is usual care group? Like, you know, we always say usual care. Does that mean nothing? Does that mean... What does usual care mean when you guys talk about it in clinical yeah, trials? In terms of the rewind uh, trial, or for that matter, any of the CV outcome trial, we're talking about the standards of care. In other words, whatever is accepted by the local authorities as the standards of care for the management of diabetes. So when it comes to a CV outcome trial, you're talking about the usual standard of care uh, and then randomize them to placebo or active treatment with the agent of interest. Um, in the case of rewind, we're talking about dulaglutide. Um, you know, in the case of, of others, you were talking about active uh, treatment. So I, I think it's important to highlight, and as Peter mentioned earlier, placebo is not placebo. We we're talking about standards of care plus the placebo, uh, as opposed to the standards of care with active treatment with dulaglutide in the case of the rewind trial. And the baseline A1C in the rewind trial was 7.2%. So these were individuals that were fairly well managed, and of course, earlier on in the disease as well, compared to the other CV outcome trials where the baseline A1C is usually over 8%, more like 83 to 8.5%. Okay, so there's now a couple of questions that have now populated here. Uh, combining GLP-1 and DPP-4, let's just take care of that one right away. Uh, so that one's a very easy one, don't. It's not worth it, it doesn't do anything extra. Um, DPP-4 inhibitors will get your endogenous GLP-1 levels up to about 16. They should be 20 if you don't have diabetes. They drop to about 8 if you have diabetes. A DPP-4 inhibitor will bring it up to about 16 to 18. A GLP-1 is right up there at 60 to 80 equivalent of GLP-1 activity. So you are just wasting your money by throwing the two drugs at each other. If you're on a DPP-4 inhibitor and you need escalation, stop the DPP-4 move to a GLP-1, and that has been tested as a good process to do. Good. I'll just take this one real quick. It's like, how come you're using a GLP-1 with somebody on insulin? They're taking insulin, so therefore the GLP-1 cannot increase the insulin from your cells because you're already replacing insulin. So remember, the other half of the GLP-1 is that it shuts down glucagon. So it tells glucagon, take it easy. You don't have to put sugar into the system. So therefore, it's not fighting against the insulin. So that's the other half of the equation for GLP-1. I, well. I just want to add to that, actually, because I, I have to do this as an advert because the team that I work with in Exeter published only yesterday that the GLP-1 has other effects beyond sugar. GLP-1 is the hormone your body produces when you've just eaten a meal that says, you've just eaten a meal, get ready for this food on the way. So it's not just about insulin and glucagon. It also tells your brain that you've eaten enough so you don't need to go and um, have another meal. It opens up the blood vessels. We've just done some work in people with and without diabetes that shows it opens up the blood vessels to the skin and to the muscles, which means that the insulin and sugar can be better delivered to where it needs to be. And that's part of the way that we don't get the weight loss because the sugar and insulin gets where it needs to be rather than just building up here. So it is not not just about sugar control, and I think we're seeing that with uh, the new um, the effects elsewhere in the body. On that note, I know that our online folks will be cut off in five seconds, so we want to thank everybody online that joined us and for your questions that you sent in, and hopefully we'll be able to do this again uh, in terms of other new data that's coming out. So we want to thank all the folks that uh, tuned in, and we want to thank our live audience. We will continue to stay on here. Uh, but thank you very much for being with us on the live webcast uh, today. And thank you especially to the large panel here of expert knowledge that we had. There's only three of them, but they seem to be able to answer and deal with all of these studies and questions at the same time. So a round of applause for everybody on stage. Okay, so now I think we're no longer broadcasting, so we can have our little session here. Um, just to go over some of the questions, maybe that you might have similar questions. Uh, we can now throw these things. So, uh, question here in the front. I wanted you to throw it. I wanted you to throw it at her. Like a, we'll talk about it. So, with this um, this trial of credence, are you now saying that we can start um, SLGT2 inhibitors uh, with a lower EGFR? And if so, how low can you go? Okay. So, good question. So, low EGFR, our current cutoff for most of the areas in the world, they're different, so is around forty-five. 
traditionally, the product monograph in the respective countries would basically say you should not consider the use of an SGLT2 inhibitor if the EGFR is less than 45. And that's primarily based on the A1C lowering efficacy. So bearing in mind that these medications were approved on the basis of the glucose lowering efficacy. Now that we have data in terms of the, not just the, uh, the A1C lowering efficacy, but the, also the CV outcome benefits, I think clearly the product monograph will change in terms of the indication. So in all likelihood, and already I think in, in different countries, uh, the EGFR uh, for the use of SGLT2 inhibitors will be lower. And this is also true for GLP-1 receptor agonists as well. But what is also important to emphasize is the fact that in the Credence trial, even though individuals with EGFR continue to below 30, they would continue on active medication and canagliflozin was deemed to be safe. So there was no uh, worse outcome with EGFR less than 30, even though the enrollment criterion was an EGFR between 30 and 90. So even though there were individuals with the EGFR drop below 30, they continue with active medication, they saw continued benefit. So it's very important to emphasize that there was no increase in acute kidney injury. The only side effects that were more apparent was a slight increase in the risk for diabetic ketoacidosis that David alluded to earlier. So I think in all likelihood, uh, I guess to be on the safe side, as, as, as a family physician, I think we should at least adhere to uh, the product monographs and what the, what the official indications are until they're being revised. Yeah, just to add to that, in the UK, none of their licenses have been changed as yet. So I don't think any of us at the moment would be advocating initiating them. I think the bit where it's changed my practice to date is that when I've had a patient whose EGFR that I started was completely reasonable, but natural progression of diabetes, their EGFR is now down to 40, 42. Theoretically, I should be stopping them, but on the basis of credence, I, I don't stop them where they, previously I would have had to, because I'm not just looking at the benefit to the, um, the HbA1c, I am looking there. So the reason I'm saying that is very often you'll find us not stopping a drug when the license says we should, that's why. But I don't think any of us would advocate starting the drug um, off the license. Until it changes, and uh, DAPA CKD yeah. will be enrolling people with DAPA, for dapagliflozin down to 25 EGFR, and then during the trial they'll probably be going lower. And that one will also have diabetes and no diabetes patients in there. So there's lots of interesting studies, which means we get to do this again, hopefully, sometimes. Yeah. Uh, that's only if you put good evaluation. So if you like me, I'm Peter Lin. If you don't like me, I'm Peter Liu. Okay, so, <laughs> so, um, so <laughs> any other questions uh, from here that we can toss? Them? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, toss. Oh, now there's a tossing. There's the, now there's a tossing. Okay, very good. My next question is, um, with GLP-1 um, helping patients lose weight, is there a role for it in pre-diabetes? Um, so there, there is, we already have uh, the drug liraglutide at a higher dose is already licensed for the use in weight loss undergoing all sorts of the HDA cost effectiveness and all sorts of things, um, approvals at the moment, but it already is being used as a weight loss drug. And there is much data out there that shows not only does it help you to reduce weight, it will hold off the um, onset of diabetes. Now it has to be very, you have to be very careful saying that you're holding off diabetes because diabetes is defined by sugar and as well as lowering weight, liraglutide will also lower your sugar. So it's very difficult to say for certain that it's really holding off the diabetes, but it has many, many other health benefits. Now there is a study going on at the moment that is looking at semaglutide in people who are overweight who don't have diabetes, and what, it's actually a cardiovascular study but one of the outcomes in there is going to be progression to diabetes. Because in that population, actually the hallmark of diabetes isn't the sugar, it's whether they get the retinopathy and the, the small vessel disease as well as the large vessel disease that we're looking at. So at the moment, I would say we do have grounds that if a diet and exercise program doesn't work, then 
the use of a GLP-1 um, would be appropriate and there is a licensed version of the raglatide to do that. I do have a lot of issues with many of our current strategies to people who we are treating with obesity dose. So please apologize, I'm on my little soapbox now. The main symptom of obesity is an increased appetite. So it's not the arthritis or the heart disease or the other things, they're the consequences of it. The main symptom of diabetes, is, of obesity rather, is increased appetite. And when we sit in our clinics and we tell a person who's got increased appetite to eat less, that is analogous to telling a person who is asthmatic to breathe less. Now, no one would say, you're asthmatic, you're short of breath, just breathe less, it's all easier. And yet, we still have this. So, I personally have a very low threshold to move beyond the diet and exercise for a person whose main symptom is hunger. And the other thing that we know GLP-1s do, and we did allude to it, is they enter the brain, and that's probably where the stroke benefit comes from, and they actually work on the arcuate nucleus, the hunger center of our brain, and says, you've just had a meal, you don't need to eat again for another three or four hours. And I think that is something we need to look very seriously at, that the obesity is not a choice, it is a fundamental disease and a difference in the way our body responds to chemicals such as GLP-1. And in the future, we're going to see PYY and many other chemicals that are involved in hunger that it should be considered for. Yeah, David? Yeah, I'd just like to add to the fact that the, the SCALE uh, trial actually did look at a pre-specified three-year study in terms of liraglutide at three milligram, which is the higher dose than the uh, liraglutide 1.8 milligram. And specifically, we're looking at people with obesity and prediabetes. Uh, so using the Weibo analysis, there was an 80% reduction in the development of type 2 diabetes uh, in this particular cohort. Now, again, as David mentioned earlier, uh, the, the critics would say, well, how can you tell uh, because the liraglutide also has glucose-lowering properties, uh, so how do you know you're truly preventing type 2 diabetes? Then when you're looking at other anti-obesity agents, for instance, going back to Orlistat, in the Zendos trial, with a 2.7% body weight loss over four years, there was a 37% relative risk reduction for type 2 diabetes. In the health behavior intervention trial, the landmark diabetes prevention program in the US, the Finnish diabetes prevention trial that was done in, 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 in Finland, they showed almost identical results. Again, a 4.7% body weight loss resulted in a 60% reduction in relative risk for type 2 diabetes. When you do the postdoc analysis, it's largely attributed to the weight loss, not so much to the physical activity. So I think that's also a very important point to, to bring out that when it comes to healthy behavior changes, it's really the fat loss that matters. And to reinforce David's point, that obesity should not be considered as a health behavior or lifestyle disease, but rather, in many ways, it, it has to do with genetic predisposition. Because we don't choose our parents, so to speak, and appetite regulation is exceedingly complex. And our bodies are designed to cope with famine, and therefore, when we're living in the land of plenty, which we are now, our genes are maladapted. So we shouldn't really blame our patients for the changes in the behaviors. Rather, I think we should blame ourselves for the lack of understanding of the body's compensatory changes following weight loss, which drive us to become more, uh, you know, to, to overeat. And I think that's a very important point. So let's not blame our patients, rather, we should empathize and understand the enormous role of appetite regulation, in which case the GLP-1 receptor agonists really prove to be a real winner because it not only uh, suppresses hunger, it promotes satiety and also decreases prospective food consumption. In other words, it helps the person to push food away even when the person is not hungry. So it really changes our understanding in, in terms of appetite control and regulation. 
So just to summarize, works very well in certain selected populations, right? Patients that have tried multiple things. For the general population, you will still be doing lifestyle because we can't be using GLP-1s on everybody, yes. Uh, and also in the, all of those studies, the, the true lifestyle where they had a coach and everything else, um, there, was, there was the best benefit, right? So the only study that was really truly uh, primary prevention for you know, the pre-diabetes people showed that TZDs did the best. Lifestyle was number two. Metformin was a, a distant third. And so therefore, TZD did a good job in preventing diabetes, but it caused four heart failures. Oh, TZD is rosy glitazone. It was rosy glitazone, okay? Sorry, so the rosy glitazone. So that one was the one, but it caused four heart failures in healthy people. So that's why the government said no go. And that's why many of the companies won't go into pre-diabetes in terms of treatment to do a study, uh, because A, lifestyle is quite good, and two, um, the governments may not sort of say pre-diabetes is a condition yet. And so therefore, you might not get approval for the agent. So please don't walk away from this and give GLP-1s to all your pre-diabetes. I don't think that's anybody's uh, commentary here. But the concept is that it does work, and there is obesity issues that are not just, oh, just control yourself. I think that, that's the problem that we've been uh, having as well. Um, other questions that might be floating around? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, good toss. There we go. A good catch. Very good. Well done. Thank you. Um, so I just with the sumaglutide, I just, you might have answered this and I might have missed it. I apologize in advance. But what was the difference between the subcutaneous and the oral in terms of outcomes? Did you mention at some point that there was more weight so, loss with the um, there oral? Were, there was slightly more weight loss. So the, the main difference was, was the, yeah. yeah, the main difference was the size of the studies. Sustain 6 was looking for 200 and 320 events. Pioneer 6 was only looking for 165 events because what they were looking for is to show cardiovascular safety to a level that is enough to get the drug to market. If you actually look at the point estimates on Sustain 6 and Pioneer 6 with the subcutaneous versus the oral, the point estimates are almost exactly the same all the way down. Um, stroke is slightly, further, is slightly better with the subcutaneous. Mortality is slightly better with the oral. But the bottom line is all of them show a very, very similar effect. And it's just that the numbers in the study was a lot smaller. The duration of the, the study was a lot smaller because those regulatory studies are done purely to keep the FDA, MHRA, European Medicines Agency, keep them happy enough to get the drug to market. And then once the drugs on the shelves, then we do the big studies because we can then start generating the revenue from using the drug in order to, to fund the, the study, the cardiovascular safety outcome trials cost billions. It's not millions, it's billions of dollars that go into those. Um, the, the actual remarkable thing is that Sustain 6, which was designed to show safety, managed to show superiority. And that's actually the truly remarkable thing about it, that it moved everything to the left. So bo bottom line, Oral semaglutide and subcutaneous semaglutide had a very similar effect on cardiovascular outcomes. The FDA have already agreed that they can regard the whole of it as semaglutide, the molecule, rather than subcut versus oral. Um, and therefore, that's why we're expecting it to be fast-tracked. And there are going to be cardiovascular outcome trials along the scale of Rewind coming along. The Soul Select uh, Focus is a study looking at people with retinopathy, but that's going to have cardiovascular outcome trials. So there's a whole series of cardiovascular outcome trials with semaglutide, but they are um, not just looking at this diabetes population because they don't need to do the pure are we safe they've come they actually they've come to market with demonstrable safety and actually if anything demonstrable benefit if we take the figures purely although actually the purists might say that if it wasn't a priori then it doesn't count but yeah so just to remind people if you see the word sustain sustain one two three four five those are all semaglutide injectable and if you see Pioneer, PO, like oral, then that's all the oral ones. So Pioneer, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so just in case you start seeing a whole bunch of these things. Injectable, all S's, and then P is all the PO stuff that is the Pioneer, okay, that you're moving forward. Some cuts of PO. Yeah, PO. All right. Um, any other questions from our audience? 
he, he wants to throw it, so he really wants uh, somebody to <laughs> take that. Right. He wants somebody to throw it, or he's going to aim at us, which is a bad thing. So, any other questions? No other questions. Closing remarks. Just some final comments. You know, like uh, okay, so we've got tons of studies. Those studies drive guidelines. The guidelines help you and I um, sort of treat our patients, right? In other words, we don't have to read all of the studies every single time. As Thomas was saying, you'd have to read all of the studies. So the guidelines kind of summarize and do that. So what, what should we be taking away now? We're seeing the studies that are showing up. What should we be taking away? Thomas, we'll start with you. You know, you're in the front lines. Yeah, uh, I mean, what um, should you take away? I, I reflect back to medical school and GP training where diabetes used to be fairly simple. You know, you had metformin. <laughs> Glycoside, insulin, and now we have all these new agents coming through. So, I mean, the challenge for primary care as a generalist, expert generalists that we are, looking after uh, average GP, looking after 1,800 to 2,000 patients, that's going up, you know, 10 minute consultations, you know, 30 to 40 patients a day. How the hell can you keep up to date with all this new um, information and guidance? And I think the key thing is, the patient at the centre, um, helping patients become expert patients in, in, their, in their care, sh um, uh, share care models, and actually thinking about, um, you know, I'm a GP, but I work in a larger team, so um, most of the diabetes care in my practice is, is um, our amazing practice nurses. Um, and we have a practice diabetes lead, um, so it's really about having that kind of, and also primary care network. So that's, um, we've had that in East London for a while where we've had diabetes care. We employ a consultant diabetologist as a community consultant diabetologist. So he doesn't look after inpatients, he looks after the community and I can email him and get advice within 24, 48 hours. So that, that means I, don't, I haven't referred a diabetic patient in, in, in years. So actually I can get that rapid advice to say, look, I don't do it very often. Can I start using this drug and that drug? And I'll get, I'll get individualized advice. And he can look at my GP record as well. So it's kind of using that technology to uh, enable, uh, enable, empower GPs and primary care teams. You know, it's not just the GP, it's actually primary care teams, the, the practice nurse, the pharmacist, in, in increasing that capacity within primary care. Because don't forget, we do 90 plus percent of diabetes. You know, it's really shifted. We do the vast majority of type two. Uh, you know, eight to ten percent of the population have it. Ten percent of the budget, we're, we're managing these patients. And actually, so my key thing is about how we can take that new evidence and it, uh, implement it easily into practice for, for, for us working in primary care. David, I, I just want to pick up on one of the comments that the the, the biggest underutilized resource that we have in primary care are actually some of the practice pharmacists. Um, we've done lots of QI work with people with diabetes about who they trust to change the medications. Practice pharmacists are trusted by um, patients implicitly anything to do with their tablets. Um, now, no one's asking practice pharmacists to become GPs and to do diagnoses or the other screening, but actually when it comes to escalating, and actually I'm seeing one or two big cheesy grins, I think we might have one or two pharmacists in the room, um, but we, we, they can escalate the care and once we've got a treatment plan in way and some with ass assistance, um, they really have the tools and the confidence and actually the time to change these medications and help beat the clinical inertia. Yeah. And of course the other area where my particular interest lies is in the deprescribing. So since the last time we got together, um, NICE have accepted our new frailty guidelines. So there are two new frailty markers from NICE of NM158 and 160, for those who are really geeky and want to know that sort of thing. But we now have new targets embedded within QOF that every person after the age of 70 should have their um, frailty assessed. And if they are frail, they should have their targets adjusted accordingly. So our new targets are to go for HbA1Cs of 8 and 8.5%, 64 millimoles per mole and 70 millimoles per mole. And we've got an audit standard within QOF of um, 75. And actually, I think that is something that we do different in the UK to the American guidelines and I believe the Canadian guidelines, where they say, if you're frail, don't even bother measuring. Now, I will say that there is a reason that we've got the guidelines like that, that um, there's been lots of work done that has taken people who believed that they were well controlled and who believed that they didn't have symptoms and brought their HbA1c down to a threshold of around 64 to 70 millimoles per mole, um, 8 to 8.5% 8 in old money. And if they bring them down to there, it reduced hospitalizations, it reduced infections, it reduced the candidiasis, it reduced urinary incontinence, and those markers of frailty that have a significant impact on the quality of life.
So in the UK, we still do have a guideline to aim for, although it is nowhere near as tight as it would be for a younger patient because simply they're not going to live long enough to get the benefit that, the, that you'd get from good, tight glycemic control. And also increased risks in LPs. Uh, yes, increased risk hypos. And but I'm also so. hearing that we don't let them fly high. No. Because when they fly high, they get dehydrated, they pee a lot, infections, and so on and so forth. So for those people, we don't have to be so tight, but let's not let them fly super high. Uh, and also our agents now don't cause hypoglycemia much, right? DPP-4, SGLT-2, GLP-1. So that's why the American guidelines, the American Endocrinology Society says, so everybody 6.5%. You know how the Americans are, right? One or the other. It's Trump, you know, this way or this way, and that's it. Um, so anyway, tariff on you. Anyway, so, um, so, so the idea is that maybe we can get down to those levels, but in the super frail and sh super short life expectancy, do we really need to do that? And I think that's the conversation that we're having. Yeah. David, last in thoughts case, for this? I'd just like to echo that prevention of hypoglycemia is absolutely key. Uh, so the Diabetes Canada guidelines, as well as the, the Endocrine Society guidelines, uh, highlight the fact that we should avoid any agents that would cause hypoglycemia, in particular, the sulfonylurea agents, the glenides, and to a lesser degree, insulin. And when it comes to insulin, I think relaxing the A1C goal is in this case important in the frail elderly, but not necessarily in the quote unquote the healthy 75 year old. That's a totally different kettle of fish altogether. Yeah, the, the healthy 75 year olds actually were represented in studies like Leader and Rewind, and they did remarkably well. Right. And their life expectancy is much Absolutely. longer than you think. <laughs> Um, and uh, coming back to the insulin, we need careful choice of insulin. Oh, absolutely. Um, the basal insulin primarily. Basal insulin. We avoid the, the short-acting insulin. a basal insulin. Um, and what we are finding, we've got a study underway at the moment, but what we find is a very, very low, low dose of an analogue, an ultra-long-acting analogue insulin will give you the same sort of control of almost twice the amount of an MPH insulin with a much lower risk of hypos. I'm saying that's ongoing study, so we have to wait until we've got the full data from that. But for practice, um, the, the ongoing, um, the insulin degladec that we can be given with this 42-hour window, for frail old adults, that is tremendously useful. We're finding doses of six to eight units. And because you've got a 42-hour window between giving it, if a district nurse or a nurse practitioner or a relative has to go and give it, then they don't have to balance their entire schedules around making sure you're there between 9 and 9.30 in the morning. Absolutely. So for those patients, <laughs> it's not just the cost of the insulin, it's the cost of the, the framework that fits around it that we, we think about. And we also see in the Canadian guidelines, for example, once you're on basal insulin and your control is not quite there, you don't have to go to mealtime insulin. Originally we thought once you're on insulin, then everything advances. So now the guidelines are recommending you can think about a DPP-4, you can think about an SGLT-2, you can also think about a GLP-1 uh, in addition to insulin, basal insulin. So therefore there's a stopping point in between before you go to four shots a day, that kind of thing. So that, that also helps with uh, uh, patients as well. I'm seeing a hand sort of partially go up. Go ahead. So, so let, me, let me just broadcast that again because no microphone. So number one is that the ACCORD study, more aggressive with that population, and there was a, increase, a slight increase in mortality. The study was stopped early, uh, whereas Carolina, uh, what's the difference there, you know, in terms of um, the uh, population? Let's start off with the population. It's mainly, it's mainly about populations, actually. Um, in ACCORD, they were a sicker population. They'd already had diabetes for eight to ten years, and they were a lot sicker. Um, and the agents available at the time were insulin, MPH insulin. Um, we were still before Glargine or Detamir being available. Um, and patients were on high-dose glinide and sulfonylurea and insulin in order to achieve those sugar targets. And we were seeing huge swings in the blood sugar. When it comes to the Carolina study, uh, we're using a far more modern sulfonylurea. 
So that's the first thing to say. The hypo rate, there was a 77% difference, um, but the severe hypo rates were still very small. Um, moderate severe hypos, 973. So actually that was just under a third of the population got a moderate to severe hypo. But we're looking at a much earlier population. When they went into Carolina, it was a, what is the second line drug? That was the primary hypothesis. After metformin, is it DPP-4 or sulfonylurea? And in those populations, you wouldn't expect to see the cardiovascular mortality occurring. You wouldn't expect to see um, the huge swings triggering the same effects that we saw in the ACCORD data. So I think what we're looking at is predominantly a difference in the patients. Actually, in ACCORD, there was very clear, the bigger your swing, the, the, the worse the problem. And so a hypo in the the conventional arm was actually worse than having a hypo in the intensive arm because you fell from there to there as opposed to the intensive arm you fall from there to there and it seemed that started the story about the glycemic shift and I think that's something that uh, lots of studies at the moment are looking at and I think that's going to be something that comes far more apparent in the, the near future as we start using more and more of the Libras and we start to see that it's not the absolute hypo, and it's not the absolute sugar, but it's the degree of shift. And I think that's where we're going to start seeing the biggest change there. But, but it's also important to mention that in the ACCORD trial, even though there was an increased mortality, as an, an ACCORD investigator, we still don't know whether or not hypoglycemia was a contributor. So there was increase in, in mortality. So the, the notion really is the, the choice of the glucose lowering regimen as a whole. So it was not hypoglycemia that drove the increase in mortality. So that, that's a, a, perhaps a bit of a misperception. So there, there actually have been papers published to underscore the fact that it was not hypoglycemia, it did not predict mortality. But we still don't know what the cause is after so many years. And it's to go back uh, to rewind study, it was looking at individuals with average of five years of, of diabetes, as opposed to the ACCORD trial, where the average duration was well over t uh, 10 years. Uh, so it's a totally different population altogether. The baseline A1C for uh, the Rewind trial was 7.2%, as opposed to over 8% in the sicker population with more demonstrable cardiovascular disease risk. So it's a very different uh, study. Altogether. And also remind, remind people that the ACCORD trial tested three things at the same time, tighter sugar control, tighter lipid control, and tighter blood pressure control. And so therefore, by having three interventions in this 10,000 population, that got very, very muddy in terms of which group got better blood pressure and so on and so forth. So that was, I think they tried to do too many things at the same time in the same study. Um, and there's also some people that said that we, it was stopped too early. So had they hung in there, and they might have seen the, the, the sometimes the graphs kind of cross back and forth like this. And we've seen that in other studies if you let it go longer. And so, but then once you have a death signal, I think it's hard, right? It's unethical to keep things going if there's a death difference. Maybe in certain countries we can still get away with that, but not in uh, sort of civilized countries. Um, and so that's why I think there might be a difference there. And it was done in a much older time frame at that time. Okay. Um, I, I see that we're running out of time even for you guys, and, and you guys have been a fantastic audience. Otherwise, we'd be talking to these reserve chairs or something like this. So we want to thank you very much. And I'll just finish on one, one just kind of quick note. I was actually at a presentation where a patient was speaking to other patients, and he was standing there with a the microphone, and he said 25 years ago his doctor told him he had type 2 diabetes, and the words from the doctor's mouth was, there is no cure, and it's progressive. So basically he felt that he had cancer and he was going to die. And he went on with his talk, and then at the end of the talk, one of the ladies in the back put up her hand and said, you know, you said your disease is progressive, diabetes is progressive, so what has progressed in your body since the 25 years? And he, you can see that he was caught off guard, but he had his microphone up to his mouth, and he was just thinking out loud. And he said, well, I haven't had a stroke. My eyes are good. I haven't had a heart attack. My kidneys are good. My legs are fine, and my toes are not numb. So then he said, really, nothing has progressed. But I notice my doctor gives me a lot of pills right now. You know, I have to take a lot of things to do that. So at that moment, that's when it struck me as to what we're doing, right? In other words, there is no cure. It is a progressive disease. But if we have these agents that can keep away the complications, and if we can do that their whole life, then effectively that's like a cure. 
And that's really what we're doing. And that's why all these studies are important. And that's why you know, we want to bring agents available with multiple mechanisms. You know, when they told us about the ominous octet, we said, oh my gosh, it's too much. But it's actually hopeful because we now have different agents attacking different areas to keep those complications away. Both microvascular, heart failure, kidney disease, heart attacks, all of those things. So on that note, I hope that this session was useful to you in bringing you some of the latest from uh, the American Diabetes Meeting. Uh, and hopefully you'll go back to your practice a little bit more energized in order to maintain our patients so that they don't get these complications. So thank you very much and thank you to the organizations that are all up there for putting this together. And these, uh, the videos will be up on the website, I believe, right, uh, sometime soon. Will be at some point uh, up on the website and so therefore you can review it if you uh, don't remember anything that we said or, <laughs> or that you wanted to see what we said again. So again, thank you very much for being with us and spending your time. Uh, and thank you to our faculty again for a wonderful job. <laughs>